Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, just seeing if we have to wait a couple of more minutes. Um, Going to let some more people in. Well, let's just start. Uh, we have a lot to do, and um, perhaps um, anyhow, before I've done my introductions. Um, and we really start with the program and there's some time still for everyone to enter. Um, very warm welcome uh, on the second day of a five day event, uh, the next generation podium for the Euro Delta. Today, we focus on the research dimension, uh, research in and about the Euro Delta. How can we, uh, use that research in the challenges that are ahead. Um, the Next Generation um, Podium is an initiative by the SURE Network, which was formed out of um, a subgroup in the Matrix Network. Uh, the Matrix, perhaps you know, is the organization um, in Europe uh, of metropolitan regions and cities. Um, and within that, the Sure Network itself is a growing network. So it's interesting to see how it's growing. It's growing by the day, almost, you can say. Um, and now, of course, uh, this week, especially with a new dimension, a network of knowledge partners, universities, uh, and this ambition to make research insights directly available um, for the Euro Delta, perhaps also this week as a starting point for some other ideas, new collaborations. Let's see where it brings us. Um, and of course, this week is the special focus on the next generation. So students and the young professionals um, coming from this area, but also uh, from uh, abroad, a very wide variety of people have enlisted to participate. Uh, this week was organized um, by part of the SURE network, uh, particularly the municipality of Amsterdam, The Hague and the province of South Holland, and also with uh, contributions from um, the cooperation between the facilitating partners, Matrix, Isocarp and Delta Metropole. Um, and my name is Paul Gerritz. I am uh, director of the Delta Metropolis Association. Um, so uh, yes, we're very happy to facilitate, to have a facilitating role in this uh, respect. Uh, the Delta Metropolis is a, a think tank for metropolitan development uh, in the Delta of the Euro lowlands. So um, very fitting that we can uh, can help uh, support this, uh, this sure network in this way. Um, please be aware the session is being recorded. It was already mentioned in the chat also uh, and broad broadcasted live. Uh, through YouTube. Um, yesterday we had some problems uh, people uh, of people entering into the into the session, but I think today um, we don't seem to have that problem as yet. So that's uh, that's good, and that's good because it's it's a lot of uh, people joining in into this conversation. There's a lot of um, uh, people attending uh, in. Um, in this week, there's over 30 uh, collaborating universities, organizations, and institutes across Europe, uh, and as I said, also beyond, um, all looking at the sustainable territorial development of this area. Uh, Eric Pasfer yesterday introduced also the SURE network a little bit, how, how we should look at it, and challenged uh, all of us to, um, to cope with also monumental and huge challenges in this Euro Delta um, 
by taking small steps and what uh, what that could entail. So that's uh, that's an interesting challenge. So let's see how how that that boils down. Um, and tomorrow we will be looking at um, at um, um, in the lunch form at um, from the perspective of the practitioners. So that will also be an interesting lunch forum. And then, of course, uh, the main event, you could say, uh, it's a little bit like the Eurovision Song Festival. At the end of the week, we will have the two day uh, where the floor will be primarily for the next generation with uh, over 60 students and young professionals working to grab together uh, to come up with new ideas and new solutions for the Euro Delta. Um, and on Friday, of course, um, unless they, they will pitch their uh, ideas. Um, and although we, we, we have a jury, a very interesting and high profile jury, so I would like to uh, advise you all to come to that uh, meeting as well. Um, unlike the Song Festival, we, we won't have a winner. Uh, but of course, I do hope that, um, that this will also become a reoccurring event. Uh, and perhaps we can also have it take place uh, live again. Um, in the future uh, in all different parts of the Euro Delta at maybe different universities. So it would be uh, nice to, uh, to see that happening. So let's see how it, how it goes. Uh, yesterday was a full program, today again. Uh, I'm going to try to do it slightly differently. I'm already uh, messing that up a little bit because I think it, it would be good to have you um, participating in the conversation a little bit more. That means that we will need to take care to keep the program short in the beginning so we have time uh, in the end to have an open discussion. We will have therefore in uh, rapid succession three talks with uh, contributions from uh, Aachen, Brussels and Delft. Um, um, Carola Hein from Delft will be uh, presenting, uh, Koba Bashar will be presenting and Christa Eiger also representing uh, uh, the RWTH Aachen, so I'm really happy that they join in. Um, and after that, we will have some help with uh, the discussion and, the, uh, and, and, and your contributions in that uh, with a panel uh, made up by Frank van Oort and, uh, and Rodrigo Cardoso. So let's um, let's start. Let's uh, let's let's see how to start. But maybe. Uh, to, to start first a little bit to have have an idea of who's uh, actually uh, represented in uh, in this meeting I would like to ask you a question through the Mentimeter no doubt you've uh, you've encountered this before um, so you can find your way around of answering this question of what is your field of knowledge so what's your background what's your expertise it would be nice to know let's see Mentimeter link is also in the chat. Um, I'm curious. We've already seen from the students that they're very cross-disciplinary. So that's, um, we also try to take care to arrange groups of students with different types of backgrounds, but I'm curious uh, what your background is. Let's see, Alan Krita, do we have? Yes. Uh, well, there we go. Um, urban planning uh, and architecture and design, of course, very, very prominently here. Um, landscape, transport and mobility, geography, economics, only one person from ecology and environment. Well, there's something to be done there for sure. Um, with uh, ah two, that's good. Let's uh, let's uh, see and, um, and and let's see if we can uh, can add to that maybe later on as well. Uh, and we have another uh, a question related to what I just said of the introduction of uh, of Eric Pasphere. Um, let's go to the next question, uh, and that is at what scale level do you work primarily? Uh, I think a lot of people will say all of the above, but uh, let's see. Do we have it? Yeah, one second.
So do you work at the local scale, at the neighborhood scale, at the city scale, maybe at the city region scale or at the mega city region scale, global level perhaps? I don't know, is it also there? All of the above, you see. Uh, regional scale, neighborhood scale also. Well, that's a nice combination, I think. The neighborhood and the region and how they interact was also a topic that was raised yesterday. Um, city scale now taking over. And of course, we need to try to focus also on the transnational scale, which can, of course, somehow be regional as well. Well, it's a nice, um, nice mix. Also, building scale uh, represented. Um, well, that's good. That's um, very nice that we have this wide variety. Um, so let's uh, let's dive into the uh, the contributions, um, the small uh, the, the the talks, the short talks, um, ten minutes each, which is of course um, yes, it's um, it's it's something we should we we should not have had to ask, but we had to because it's a lunch forum, so we, sh we should not make it too long. But of course, um, we could listen on end uh, to any of the three speakers that we, uh, that we have now. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to introduce them uh, all to you now. And afterwards, I think it would be nice if we, if we can just have the conversations uh, one after the other. So, um, and, and, um, and I would, would um, would like to ask you uh, to present in this order. So I would like to introduce Carola Hein, Professor of History of Architecture and Urban Planning at the TU Delft, uh, and also representing the cooperation, the, the new emerging cooperation between the universities of Leiden, Delft and Rotterdam. Um, and she will be talking about uh, Port City Futures. Uh, Koba Bassau, uh, Professor of Spatial Planning and Mobility at the Freie Universiteit of uh, Brussels. Uh, particularly at the center of urban research, Cosmopolis. Um, he will be talking about planning for uh, agglomeration economics in a polycentric region. And uh, I'm very happy to also introduce to you Christa Reicher, professor at RWTH Aachen and head of the Institute of Urban Design and European Urbanism, um, uh, talking about uh, transforming city regions. So, um, I'm very happy you could all join in and uh, have a short presentation. Um, and I would like to invite uh, Carola now to to uh, to start with her presentation. So Carola, the floor is yes. yours. Well, thanks a lot for um, inviting me. Thanks a lot for this great event. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, what I would like to t talk to you about is a background on what we do or what we think about in Port City Futures and what this actually could mean also for the Euro Delta. So first of all, the, there is a couple of ideas that are un underlying our Port City Futures uh, Leiden Delft Erasmus collaboration. Um, and I invite you all to go to our, to our website. Um, do you see the sharing actually? It tells me it's paused. No, not, not yet. We see your um, whole screen. So also yeah. with the notes. Oh, okay. Now that's not the idea. Let me go back once more. Uh, hold on. Why does this not? Uh, give me one second. Usually it works very well, but then not that we do this all day long. Okay. Give me. There we go, I will start again. So um, the invitation to you is this showing now? Still not. Some no, still not. It tells me it's yes. sharing. Now yes. it's fine. Okay. Now it's fine. Okay, thanks. Apologies. So I would like to invite you to look at the Port City Futures website to also see what the goal of this uh, collaboration is. But I'm not going to present you what we do. I would try to use the things that we focus on 
to talk about the, the Euro Delta um, concept and the project. Now, for me, it seems important to tie together space, society, and culture. And I think that some of the comments yesterday already pointed in that direction. On the one hand, this is a physical reality, and that's what we have to engage with. It's important to have economic numbers and other statistics, but it all takes place in space. And so this interaction between people, between what we think about places and the place itself, I think is very important. And that also means not only taking into account technological innovation, and we had proposals yesterday about single uh, tickets to travel on single uh, different modes of transportation, but we also had com comments about the importance of recognizing the culture of water, for example. So I would really agree with the fact that we need to bring all of these together, that we need to talk about border crossings and not just on land, but also with the sea. The document map mentions mapping quite a bit, and I think it's a really important research methodology, but we also have to be aware of what we do. And in the end, I would really like to plead for a value-based approach. So I would like to take you on a quick tour with a number of images and hope that some of this sticks and might even inspire some of the projects. Now, the new generation podium starts with this beautiful picture uh, and it shows us a lot, but it also shows us some things that are missing. And maybe that is something where the new generation also wants to look at because the sea is not empty. The sea is filled with all kinds of activities and these activities very much determine what is going on in the hinterland, on the rivers, uh, in the cities, on the port cities that are along the Rhine Valley, for example. So first question, can we populate the water and think both about it as a space, as a place and uh, as a cultural um, location? So. For me, I would like to invite you to start the view of the project from the sea to see the North Sea as a commons. And this is actually also the, um, the, the foundation of a book that we just published on the urbanization of the sea. And the idea behind this is that if we change our focus from a land-based one to a sea-based one, it will also help us overcome some of the national borders the other disputes and the other implications of uh, research, of languages and so on that we often face. And it also means that we have to think the sea, think of the port of Rotterdam that needs access to water and the challenges that keeping the water out means for other areas. So there's always this relation between sea and land that you might want to strengthen. Now I mentioned mapping as a theme. Mapping is really interesting and important, and it can be a research tool. So what we've been trying to do now is to map around the North Sea several of the port city regions. And I think this could also be a way to um, explore the cities inside the Euro Delta on a similar scale based on similar challenges that they've been facing. So what we've been doing is looking at it through time um, so that we not only look at one time, one moment in time through space or one space through time, but really to think about changing perspectives. And in this case, how does the relation between water and land, between port and city change over time? Now, so far we've done this for three cities, but what we are trying to do is develop a methodology that can then be applied to other cities, to go beyond the pure um, focus on economic geography, where you have beautiful maps, but they don't land in space. They don't land at any scale. You've been asking to, to, for people at what scale they work. Now, trying to understand what the drivers are between be, uh, behind different developments is very important. And I think we can, from a historical perspective, understand what the values are that have driven specific developments. So in the case of Rotterdam, for example, our mapping, I would argue, shows that the port has been in the lead where the cities have followed. In case of London, we've seen the port escaping from the city with the headquarters still remaining there, but the port really having left the city in different ways that, the, that it has in, um, in Rotterdam. 
And in the case of Hamburg, where you really have a tandem, uh, and in this mapping, we've also in included institutional boundaries to show how port and city authorities have found a way to balance each other over time. Now, we've started to expand this methodology to other places. There's colleagues now work working on the Adriatic, um, but also bringing in, for example, maritime flows, shipping into this picture and comparing what happens to the various major ports around the Adriatic, including uh, Venice, Rijeka, Ravenna, and Copa. And you do see the relationship that is changing between the industrial ports and the city of Venice here, for example, over time, and both in terms of the scales of this relationship, um, but also what it means then for the, for the heritage of the site, for the functionality of the site, for the institutional governance. And so these are two examples from the seaside, from the coasts, but I'm sure we could be doing the same thing, and I think we should be doing the thing, same things. For example, Duisburg port, the world's largest inland port. And so let's focus also in the uh, projects that we're developing, and you're saying this here, to also on the, on the rivers and the cities that are related to them. Now, this is also a call to, again, rethink mapping. It's a wonderful, wonderful map, but it raises the question for me, so where is the water? Where are the rivers? Where are the ships? What's the relation between smaller cities that are port cities and other cities? And I would like to make one more point. So I've been arguing that there's a port cityscape that reaches from the sea to the hinterland logistics infrastructure, but it's also represented. So what of this spatial areas do we actually see and consider? So what's the mindset that is related to it? And we've been arguing that port cities are usually very strong cities. They're very resilient. They are used to uh, adapt to, to changing conditions and to promote them. But that also means a lot of frictions. And these frictions, I think, are very important to bring to the front. And when you think about the Euro Delta, and I like this website of windy.com, showing us the pollution. This pollution is not stopping at sea or land borders or at national borders or somewhere else. So if we really want to improve it, and this is just on 14 or 15 or 18 miles, it's very recently, 14 May, you see how much pollution is generated. So we need to find ways to overcome the dualities, the challenges between port and city, between land and sea. And I just would like to point you to this group, VEEK, which is a 1517 created group of commercial people in Hamburg uh, who have come together around shared values. So honesty, uh, punctuality, trade. And I find it really interesting to see that it's possible to have decision makers gather around values as a means to guide their actions. And so as we want to overcome dualities of industry and city, of heritage and migration, of logistics, etc., how do we do this? And can a value-based approach help us engage with these challenges? So from that perspective, and here's a little more moment of advertisement in there, we've just, we're launching a course on Reimagining Port Cities, Understanding Space, Society, and Culture. If anybody is interested, it starts on the 26th. But what I'm arguing is that when you develop projects, and this is a design project from my students, take into account the values that you want to achieve. Think about a long-term future, even as you want to take small steps, but first put a, uh, put a dot on the horizon, 2080, and then think about the adaptive strategies that can actually get you where you want to be, uh, to make sure that these are also the goals. And to end with, this is also a le lesson from history. If we look back how many changes have happened in, say, the last 60 years, then think about what changes can happen in the next 60 years and what it would help, what it would need to make them happen. And if I am ending on a on a, on, a, on a critical note or on a note to launch you into design, maybe our smartphones have done more to urban space 
than spatial planning has done when you just think about how it has transformed space. So that may be something up for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carola. Uh, um, I would like to propose to uh, immediately go to the next contribution and then we have some more time uh, afterwards uh, for, uh, for some discussion and, uh, and uh, questions perhaps even. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Kobe, could you perhaps start your presentation? Um, yes, uh, good afternoon. I will try to share my screen as well. Not sure if you see it. Yes. yes. So good afternoon, everybody. I am Kobe Busso. I am working as an assistant professor of spatial planning and mobility at VUB Brussels University in Belgium. And I will talk about an applied research project I did with a number of colleagues. Uh, you see them here from uh, Ghent University and also from TU Delft. It was an, an applied research project that was commissioned by the Flemish government. So this is the northern part of Belgium. Uh, and it's called Planning for Agglomeration Economies in a Polycentric Region, Envisioning an Efficient Metropolitan Core Area in Belgium. Um, so we started from uh, the idea that the regional settlement patterns in Western Europe, and particularly in the north of, of Belgium, that they are characterized by a large number of small, small sized cities and towns. So there are no real big cities. Um, that they still perform perform well in an economic sense, and that at the same time, uh, level, the levels of quality of life are rather high in this region. And we wonder to what extent we could consider this region a polycentric metropolitan area. So you see here how it looks like uh, in the middle of the night from outer space. Um, a number of larger cities are, are part of the, of the study area, notably Brussels, Antwerp and Ghent, but also a number of regional cities and smaller towns and a lot of urban sprawl, uh, of course. Um, with respect to economic performance, um, we, uh, yeah, we noticed that a tradition, from a traditional urban economics perspective that um, yeah, cities that are bigger seem to perform better from an, in an economic sense. And then the question is to what extent can polycentric uh, networks, polycentric urban regions um, approximate the same level of economic performance? Uh, under which conditions could such a system be competitive with something that would be like a single large city composed of the same number or uh, a, similar, um, a similar number of inhabitants and jobs. Um, from a quality of life perspective and also sustainability perspective, we also note that bigger cities perform less well than uh, let's say smaller cities. And this is something that is stressed usually not very much by urban economists, but rather by urban planners, who uh, are inclined to stress the human scale um, and uh, seem this, uh, well, uh, appreciate, this as an, appreciate this as an important aspect of uh, smaller sized cities and towns. Um, so from, yeah, from these ideas, uh, we developed a, a number of research questions. And first research question was, the question of whether it is possible to combine livability uh, benefits that are typically associated with smaller, small sized cities and towns with economic be benefits that are typically associated with large cities in what we could call a polycentric urban system. Second question about what, what critical mass are we talking? How many people and jobs do we actually need if we want to, um, yeah, to achieve the econom economies of scale that are typical, typical for a well-performing large urban conurbation? And then the third, the most applied part of the research question or the set of research questions is how should growth of this polycentric case to the area, so the north of Belgium, how should it be directed aiming at strengthening both economic performance, but also taking into, into account uh, sustainability and livability constraints? Um, so we uh, started from a literature review and then we did spatial analysis where we try to map uh, the agglomeration potential. You will see in a couple of, of slides from now what I mean with that. And then the third part of the research was organizing a number of stakeholder uh, workshops in which we wanted to envision a number of uh, plausible scenarios for sustainable metropolitan, placentric metropolitan growth. 
So the, from the literature review, we learned that, um, well, indeed, uh, polycentric metropolitan areas, they vary in size and level of interaction. So there is like a wide range of, of, of them, uh, a wide variety of them. But what is what is kind of a common characteristic that is that um, the higher the level of internal connectivity, the better they perform in an economic sense. So internal connectivity is really determining for economic performance. Then from the optimum city size literature, we derived um, or we derived that actually cities that yeah, um, are like nodes or, or um, focal points and global networks that they yeah they are characterized by like a minimum uh, a minimum threshold of yeah between 1.5 and 2 million inhabitants inhabitants. Although the recent the more recent literature is that we reviewed, the more upwards this uh, threshold was uh, uh, adjusted. And then we also looked into the literature on transit-oriented development because we thought that transit-oriented development could be the clue to, um, yeah, to organize the polycentric system in a, in a more sustainable uh, manner, as opposed to a road transport uh, development. Um, then we went to the spatial anal analysis where we tried to visualize the agglomeration potential. Um, we, did, we did this by assuming these Un, uh, minimum population thresholds. Um, we took the existing railway network as a basis, as a, as a backbone for future uh, urban or polycentric urban development, where we assumed that transit service uh, would um, would be offered at high fre frequency. And we also selected a number of uh, actually the most important cities as they exist now as the anchor points for this network. And then we developed the, the accessibility, accessibility maps by um, yeah, mapping who would be part, given the, the current residential structure, who would be part of such an, an urban a polycentric urban agglomeration of, for example, 1.5, but then also 2, 2.5, etc., cetera, uh, a number of million uh, inhabitants. And we did this calculation for Flanders and Brussels only, which is a bit at odds with, of course, with the perspective of, of the current um, yeah, conference, I think, because uh, this was a study commissioned by the Flemish government, and it was actually, uh, well, it was not part of the assignment to um, look at cross-border border interaction. But of course, uh, yeah, this idea could be uh, elaborated in a, uh, from a cross-border cross border perspective as well. Um, so this is how the spatial analysis maps looked like. Um, so in the legend, the uh, numbers you see there, they uh, point to the, well, um, the million of an, numbers of million of inhabitants that would be part of the system. Um, you see that we, that the, the analysis shows actually uh, the railway corridors in the northern part um, of Belgium centered on the city of Brussels, city of Antwerp, and then also the city of Ghent and uh, Leuven. And then you see, yeah, everything that is red comprises a current population of up to 2 million people. Um, but the further you move away from the railway stations, um, the larger the population included in this uh, conurbation um, um, yeah, the, the larger the population, which is included in the conurbation that is modeled. Um, then we took uh, these maps into a visioning workshop where we tried to elaborate a number of uh, metropolitan growth scenarios. We looked for densification opportunities with regards to first additional housing opportunities and second additional employment opportunities, where we took into account the proximity to the existing urban agglomerations and second, um, yeah, the, the condition that these new developments needed to be included in, the, in these uh, threshold values and also the uh, with, within actually within short distance of the railway stations that were um, included in the in the model um, in order to yeah develop uh, develop um, in line with a transit oriented development strategy and so these are the maps that uh, well the maps the structure uh, structure maps that were derived from the workshop so here you see like the conurbations that need to be strengthened but also like a, a couple of you could call them even uh, new towns so existing settlements that need, would need to be strengthened uh, uh, in order to uh, receive the additional population growth uh, similar for additional growth of employment and industrial activities um, and then uh, the, the next question was uh, which transit connections need to be um, 
uh, strengthened in order to support this uh, development model. Um, so um, as conclusions, I can say that, um, that, yeah, first we found that livability requirements, that they put limits to urban expansion and to growth of road transport, urban expansion in the sense of, you know, urban sprawl, urban spread, uh, but also uh, road transport um, from an environmental and a livability perspective, of course, that road-based uh, accessibility potential is no longer a realistic way for modeling daily urban systems that we uh, rather need to look uh, into railway systems um, that strength the strengthening of existing urban agglomerations in our case the brussels antwerp axis and the surrounding areas um, and uh, selective transit oriented development that it may be used to valor valorize uh, existing agglomeration economies and then there are a few, uh, pro memory, I uh, mentioned that there is also uh, still room for like generic employment that is attached to existing settlements, uh, to the urban sprawl um, and existing villages. Uh, and then the second um, caveat is that there are in Belgium, there seem to be like uh, a number of important in institutional barriers that are attached to the regional governments that do not have uh, exactly the same vision on uh, urban and regional development. Um, and this is where I would like to, um, to close. So here is the reference to the paper that was published based on this uh, research in the European Journal of Spatial Development. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Corbe. Uh, um, another kind of... Uh, uh, insight and um, very welcome um, and we will have time to discuss it uh, later on and uh, as uh, Malafika already put in the chat please post your questions also during uh, the talk you can uh, post your questions in the chat so that we can pick up on that later but for now I would like to uh, ask Christa Reicher to uh, to give her talk uh, so I hope you're there. Ah, there you go great floor is yours Yeah, thank you for um, inviting me. Do you see my uh, screen? Yeah. It's not yet full screen, so. It's perhaps not full can... screen, so sorry. So I will try to put it full screen or I will try it once more, one moment. Yeah. Maybe. So I don't know what happened now. Okay. Um. So do you see it? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Yes, so, perfect. Um, Thank you for inviting me. So it was really interesting to see the two presentations. I will try to give a little bit a personal approach to your topic because um, I was walking, working for 15 years at the Faculty of Spatial Planning at TU Dortmund and now I'm working at a Faculty of Architecture in Aachen. So I want to um, explain you a little bit um, how I came from my research approach to a kind of teaching approach, which is now called transforming city regions. And on the other hand, I want to show you how our teaching and research was influencing our planning, planning strategy and the other way around, because now we are working on a kind of planning strategy called law. That means for the agglomeration between Mars and Rhine. And these two, um, two approaches I want to uh, present in my um, introduction. So uh, during my work in the Ruhr Valley, I was uh, studying a lot the urban transformation of this former industrialized area. And on the first hand, the uh, first step, we worked on a kind of analysis of the whole region, 
called layers of the region to make clear how this region was transformed during the last 150 years. Then we looked on the people, on the histories of the people in the region and looked what was, were their approaches to have a quality of life in the region. And at the end, we came to some spatial strategies for the region. And this strong, let's say, research within different research projects brought me to a kind of approach to implement an international master program called Transforming City Regions. But what was interesting in our research was that we combined the rural region and on the uh, left side above you see the rural region and compared it with other metropolitan cities like London, like Istanbul, Barcelona, and so on. And this fits me to what Kobe explained, the big chances of a polycentric region and a polycentric uh, strategy. So looking back to the rural region, we saw how the industrialization influenced the spatial strategy of such a region not only the smartphone, yeah, but the, the power of working, the power of industry and um, people coming to this region to understand what are the opportunities in the field of work, in the field of um, neighborhood conditions and so on. So these two slides show you the situation of the same site in the year nine, in 1900 and in the year 2010. So, and you see what happened in the rural region. This is a picture from Essen, from the new Thyssen head uh, uh, quarter. But uh, what I want to explain is that um, regarding the international building exhibition as a kind of new planning approach, the darkly not used industry is now not at all regarded as an unuseful um, fabric, but as a kind of new awareness of a site and a new awareness of a region. So what we uh, did in our research was to identify a unique approach on urbanity. We called it at the end, urbanity, that means when we look on the different talents and characteristics of a region, you, you see here some maps, you understand the specific conditions of such a region. And this is really important to come to new approaches. And one of our main findings was, on the one hand, to look on the region because we have a landscape, we have the river Emscher and other different um, regional rivers, but on the other hand, we have the level of the quarter, which is really important. Quarter means neighborhood, the district uh, environment, the people living in the different districts. And uh, my approach was, and there was a strong discussion about this, to say that the city is not important as a level. So we have the neighborhood and we have the region. And the city is, let's say, somehow something in between. And out of these different approaches of research, we come, came to the conclusion that it is really important to take this outcome um, as a fundament for a new master program called Transforming City Regions. And what you see here, these are different books out of different conferences, a conference about the polycentric city regions in transformation in the rural area in 2050. Then we focused on public space as a backbone of the region. And we focused at uh, the end on um, the strategy of urban integration. So this was my first approach dealing with uh, the strategy and the research of the rural region. And now working in Aachen, we have a, a different background. 
And the focus is a little bit different. And now we are looking how we can develop a region a little bit um, by overcoming the national borders and overcoming, let's say, the different interests of the country. And Lo means the agglomeration between Mars and Rhine. Uh, four years ago, I started with my planning office in um, working on an agglomeration concept for the metropolitan area Cologne and Bonn. So the question of Cologne and Bonn was, how can we develop such a metropolitan area which is getting more and more dense in a sustainable way? And how can we plan for more than 200,000 people without um, having an urban disaster in this metropolitan um, area? So this question, how can we use the bigger scale, the scale of the region to bring such a metropolitan area into a balance? was one of the main questions. And this strategy, the, the cologne Bonn agglomeration concept, we um, linked with a, uh, with a strong uh, participation process. You see here, not the normal people, the uh, people of the region, but those people who are stakeholders, who take the decisions on the administrative level but they were really strongly involved into this project, into this, it was a kind of planning uh, project. And at the end, we came to a kind of agglomeration concept, how to develop the built environment, but also how to use the landscape and the mobility uh, to develop a sustainable balance between the different cities, Cologne and Bonn, but also to take into account the reach, regional approach. So when I started here my um, new position at the RWTH Aachen, I was asked from my federal minister for um, urban affairs and um, business affairs to um, be supervisor of the agglomeration process of the Rheinische Revier. That means um, the mining district between Cologne and Aachen. I have the feeling that you uh, um, know a little bit about this region. Uh, at the moment, it looks like this, but the political decision is that in 2038, um, the coal production has to stop. And that the question is, how should the new future of such a really interesting landscape, which is the biggest landscape construction in Europe should look, look like. So it is a big challenge uh, to answer the question regarding these big areas which are under construction and in transformation. What should the new shape look like? And we are currently discussing with students, but also within our project in total, what ways into the future are possible to plan for more than 300,000 people in this region. Uh, on the one hand, we discussed about strengthening um, the different backbones, um, the um, tracks of the railways and so on, but we were also looking on a kind of polycentric development. We are discussing a new city within the whole dist uh, district, or for example, to strengthen the Erft corridor. And my um, last message is uh, looking at the strategy of the Rheinische Revier. We were asked um, to link the Rheinische Revier with a new strategy for Südlimburg and to combine the different strategies. And when you look on such a landscape in Südlimburg, you see that this is a similar like in the region of cologne born or in the Rheinische Revier. That means the landscape is not stopping at the federal or national borders, but we have similar problems, 
similar strategies. And now we are working on this kind of integrated strategy for spatial development in Südlimburg, but having the view on a all regional context that means not stopping at the national borders, but having the same approach as we did in Cologne Bonn, as we are now working on the Rheinische Revier and in parallel to Südlimburg. And this is my message that we have to link um, our outcome out of the research projects and introduce them into our planning strategies and in our teaching strategies and the other way around. And my main message is that I'm convinced that the future of the city is the region and it is the uh, uh, international region and not the federal region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christa, for that very insightful uh, presentation. All of you, actually. Uh, uh, thank you also for keeping uh, quite a bit to the time. So uh, that, that leaves a lot of uh, time for us to, uh, to discuss. And I would like maybe to first also come give, give some, some space for some questions. We've seen um, now a lively, um, lively chat going on. Uh, so perhaps we can can meet up with uh, with the speakers just for a short moment to uh, to have these questions um, um, discussed a little bit. Uh, let me see if that if that works out. Can I can I all get you in into view? Yeah, great. Manafika is helping me out, I guess, from the background um, because there were quite some uh, some questions already. Uh, uh, directly answered also by Koa, but also a couple of them um, not particularly. And um, uh, it's um, it's maybe interesting what I what I already see from the presentation from Krista that it would already be a, a great idea to um, to work together more closely in in organizing and and uh, gaining insights into how to come to spatial strategies. Yeah? So the process of doing that, I. I've been involved in a, in a very, um, uh, very interesting uh, process in the in the Ruhr area a couple of years ago, and you see something happening in uh, in uh, in Köln Bonn area, but also a number of numerous places in in Flanders and uh, and the Netherlands, and and already seeing sort of similarities and and uh, and differences there would be very interesting, I think, to to come to conclusions. So. Uh, there were some uh, questions asked um, regarding the time horizon, so I would, would be interesting to to come to the, that uh, uh, point, uh, particularly to Christa and Carola. Where, where the question was, how do you decide what is the planning horizon you you do your research for? Like how, like does it make sense to look fifty years ahead? My feeling, we have to do that, but at the same time, how? fruitful can it be for creating strategies that can start in the here and now? It's yeah, I, I must question. make one comment, one comment in advance, because I liked it really much as, uh, uh, listening to uh, Carola and her approach of um, the role of mapping. And this was really great. Mapping has a strong force on us as architects and urban planners. And I did not really regard it uh, or I did not have it in mind uh, when I started with this kind of mapping. And the second point is to Kobe, the polycentric approach is really one of the most sustainable approaches because in Germany, we are discussing about how to densify our city, but regarding the climate change and so on, we have to look for sustainable ways beside it. And this means polycentric development. So uh, now to the, to the question, uh, the time uh, schedule. Yeah, uh, in the rural region, we said, uh, first we do a mapping, then we discuss about the time schedule. And in the planning uh, uh, pro approach, 10 years are nothing. Yeah, Ten, you can build a house 
or um, uh, um, um, yeah, buildings, but um, you cannot really develop such a strategy like the transformation of the Emshas. It takes you 25 years, yeah. And with this in mind, in uh, the, the Ruhr Ru Valley, we looked at the end uh, at the date 2037, uh, because then uh, the International Garden Exhibition has taken place and a lot of transforming processes are coming to an end. In the Rheinische Revier, we are looking on completely different uh, time schedules. We are focusing on 10 years, on 20 years, and on the year 2070, because 2070, the, lands, uh, the lake district will be realized. And then we have, the, let's say, the final picture somehow um, in front of us. So um, the, the, the time schedule depends from the different strategies of the regions and the cities and their ambitious, um, yeah, individual strategies. Yeah, okay, so you say it's very contextual. It depends really yeah. on what kind, of, or, um, what kind of milestones you could foresee which makes sense in the discussion of the region. Yeah. Uh, uh, Carola, can you add to that? Yeah, maybe add to that a couple of things. Uh, and start from history. I mean, that's why we also started this mapping from 1300. See in what time periods, what changes took place. And then you can understand how far you also have to look into the future. So if we see what kind of containerization, what kind of communication technology, etc., has always produced changes, how quickly do they come in? Uh, petroleum arrived first in 1862 in, in, in the port of Rotterdam. It changed the port, it changed the cities, etc. So when we see that these kind of changes happen over 150 years, they may be happening quicker now, but in order to undo some of these changes, that's at least the time horizon that we have to look ahead. Knowing also, and particularly for anything green, knowing how petroleum has changed our this entire area, and we've done some map or I've done some mapping on that, you can understand what it would actually take to have a green revolution. And I would call the petroleum revolution also that. So not only do you have to do something new, but you also have to undo what has been done from legal systems to physical spaces to institutions. All of this is embedded in the petroleum scale. Now that's one thing. And Again, pleading for the long horizon, um, this institution that I mentioned from Hamburg, the honest, the, the Ehrbare Kaufmann, um, <laughs> is, is one that has existed for 500 years around values. So if we can agree on what we want to achieve and what values are behind it, then it might be easier to go and set up the little steps because then you know what your decision is headed towards. I mean, that's also the what Delft Design for Value stands for. Now, and that is, I, I'm just going to spin it back to the other question, what kind of data did we use? Well, this is all based on, on, on open data. Um, we're trying to put together a handbook on how to map so that different people could use the same thing. Also in architectural schools, and that's what our colleagues in Slovenia used, and keep refining it. So Ivone van Mill is behind it. Um, behind the handbook, and I'm happy you just contact me. I, I shared one of our articles that is called Mapping as Gap Finder with the idea that we understand where conflicts exist between institutional levels and spatial levels, then we might be identifying the places where interventions need to occur. And often those are the ones where boundaries exist, where conflicts exist. Uh, and so, yes, ideally, we should be using all of this based on open access data and bring it, uh, bring it together from there, which is really interesting, just as a moment in between. Um, uh, Yvonne told me once, for example, the name, I think, for a certain type of soil, sand or so, um, the, this type of material ends at the Belgian border, and it just doesn't jump into, the, into France. Well, obviously, it does. But just because these things are called something different, there is even in mapping a kind of hidden designer, an invisible 
um, force behind it. And I think those are the things we really have to try and overcome. And that's also why I showed you windy or water. Those things don't care about the borders that exist. And maybe if I can do one more comment on the sure, question, sure, yes. <laughs> question regarding the, the private enterprise. In some ways, um, maybe if the, and again, that's one other reason why I mentioned this Hamburg, uh, the Ehrbare Kaufmann organization. If private enterprise can come together around values, those can help establish what we, what maybe sometimes the public sector is more difficult to move. I mean, historically, when you think about the Hanseatic cities, et cetera, there has always been a, this collaboration, particularly in port cities where traders influenced or were politicians and shaped the politics around it and often taking into account social justice questions. I mean, Hamburg is not the only and beautiful example, but it happens to be my hometown, which I know well, where even when housing districts were demolished for the extension of the port or the destruction of new administrative districts with all its problems, there was still the construction of a metro line and new social housing for the port workers. And I think that has often been a reason to create this resilience of port cities that the actors, the stakeholders and often private stakeholders had to think for the entire population to keep their trade and their activities going. So in some way, it's really a plea for more value-oriented, value-based collaboration of private partners that helps overcome limitations of national planning of boundaries that exists and goes beyond it. Yes, well, great. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, that was a lot of answers there. And I, uh, I also uh, uh, agree to a lot of things you said because I, I, I feel that uh, we as a Delta Metropolis Association also need to cope more with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the issues of, uh, of good mapping. Yeah? So we're doing that a lot and we use a lot of these geo databases and we've came ac across a lot of problems with the categorization and questions and stuff like that. Yeah? So I think we need to do better in the Euro Delta especially. Uh, so we should perform uh, better in that respect. Um, one more question I would like to uh, have answered a little bit further before we introduce, maybe we can just introduce them to the to the panel since it's such a lively conversation as it is, but I would like to uh, ask Kova to, to go into the question of the cross-border collaboration um, question that was raised in the chat. Uh, you looked with your research specifically on the Flemish side uh, since that was the commissioner, but of course you you know that um, that there is a lot of uh, cross-border um, um, communication going on, uh, also in terms of um, of, uh, of commuting. Um, also there, actually, we found quite a lot of problems in the data and in terms of the preciseness of where people originate from and where they go to. Eh? It's, it's suddenly you all go to the Netherlands instead of different places in the Netherlands, if you look at the data from Flanders and vice versa from the Netherlands as well. But the question was really like, how do you uh, see it happening that the uh, ideas and conclusions and advices that we come up with, it is research, lead to anything um, in, uh, in cross-border uh, development because it's such a difficult hurdle to cooperate cross-border. How do you look at that? Yeah, um, in Belgium, we have actually a lot, of, a lot of experience with borders. I would even uh, dare to say that our internal borders have become more visible and have been become stronger over the last uh, decades, which is, of course, a disadvantage to uh, coordinated or integrated uh, planning. And you see it already in, in the study I presented. We had to include uh, the Brussels capital region in our um, our spatial analysis. That was obvious for the for the very uh, reason that Brussels is is actually the the economic core area of the of the Belgian economy, or at least an important part of it. So we could certainly not omit it. But we did not include uh, part of Wallonia, uh, although there is, especially in um, in the region. Um, just south of Brussels, it is an um, economically important region that is well connected to Brussels and to Flanders and where there is indeed like um, cross, a lot of cross-border commuting. 
at least um, across the internal, uh, the language border in Belgium. But then when it comes to the external borders, the borders with the, with the Netherlands and, and France, and then of course also uh, Germany and, and Luxembourg, when, when it comes to Belgium, um, it's indeed true that uh, collection of data is, uh, is not uh, happening in a uniform way that um, that that we we lack some some information about it, and that also like yeah the, the policies when it comes to yeah, urban planning policies are really different. You see it already if you look at an aerial picture compare the Netherlands with Flanders. Well, that's one of the pictures I, I show in um, yeah in my classes on on urban planning. Of course, we we once were the same country um, in the early 19th century. And then afterwards, it seems that we totally diverted uh, in terms of, um, yeah, of, of, a, of a view and, and also the legal aspects of, of urbanization. And it, yeah, we, we really suffer from it, I think, because um, the study I, I presented, the focus was very much on, on the residential structure. So the economic development was part of it, but it was quite clear that the first, um, yeah, the, the, the stress was mostly on, on how to plan for, for residential urbanization and that we, we, yeah, we really need to take into account and yeah, the path dependency of the past. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it, it's very strong. I mean, it, uh, it blocks like, yeah, change uh, because it is like uh, cemented uh, in, an, um, in a legal way. And it it works totally totally different in, in the Netherlands. And so, yes, I think more economic integration is of course possible. Um, but when it comes to urbanization, to how urban urban development, especially uh, of the residential structure, how to co coordinate this across the borders, I'm still a bit, yeah, I'm not, it's not very clear to me how we will uh, be able to to yeah, co coordinate this better in the in the near future. Yeah, well, perhaps a good start is already with this kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, cross border collaboration and getting to know each other. I think that's always plays a very important uh, role in in terms of understanding each other and also uh, achieving uh, something in that respect. Um, so maybe uh, we can uh, invite uh, Rodrigo and, uh, and Frank van Oort uh, also to, uh, to, to the conversation, but I would like to keep the speakers in, in the conversation also, if you agree. Um, and we have uh, half an hour, a small half an hour to, uh, to, to come to a, a couple of points that I would like to raise um, in terms of also maybe directing a little bit to the assignment of the next generation. And it was also a question that was raised by Eric Pasveer, uh, who's, uh, who, who also had the introduction uh, talk yesterday uh, from the city of Amsterdam, from the municipality of Amsterdam. Uh, he was uh, raising the question, uh, what are actually the, really the strategic uh, projects or strategic uh, spatial issues at hand that you could take as a starting point for, uh, for, for, for such a uh, a moment of change. So um, I would like to maybe first give the uh, reaction to uh, Rodrigo and then afterwards Frank and then maybe uh, uh, speakers can add into that as well. Um, so Rodrigo, would you like to, to start with raising maybe some fundamental topics that we can also use uh, later on in the week uh, for, uh, for the students and young professionals from this next generation to, to focus on? What's your thoughts about Okay, uh, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. Well, since this is uh, something directed at the new generations, uh, how will they produce knowledge and new research, I would like to include someone else in this, uh, in this discussion, uh, Lucas Höller, who is here also in the audience. If you, Paul, could uh, also put him in this uh, main view. Yeah, if that's go ahead. Hello, hi. <laughs> okay, there it is. Uh, the reason why Lucas is here is because we are going to start to work together on a project uh, called Second Tier Port Cities as a Gateway to Sustainable Urbanization. That's one of the 12 new uh, PhD projects launched by the faculty. And uh, well, we figured it is extremely related to the Euro Delta topic. Uh, and so we proposed to Alan Grita in the when in the invitation came that we would do it together, also a bit uh, discussing with Carola, who is also part of this team, 
Um, and if I can very quickly describe what this project is about, maybe we will find some interesting uh, links to the Euro Delta discussion. Uh, to start, in, in, in the back of, of the, let me go to the side, in the back uh, of our uh, image, we have a little twist that we have done to the Euro Delta map where we have marked in red um, a lot of small to medium sized port cities. Um, along the Rhine that basically build a continuous fabric of urbanization and of infrastructural assets that fly a little bit below the radar, let's say, of the usual networks of big metropolitan places. And that's one of our interests here because yesterday we heard some discussions about how do we make this meaningful for the citizens? How do we make this idea leave the minds of policymakers and researchers and be, let's say, recognizable by the regional, by stakeholders, by local agencies? How do we, ins we ensure willingness to cooperate by different municipalities, for example? And for us, one of the main uh, ways to do that is to pay attention to the places of the in-between, the places that are outside the networks with, we, with which we usually represent this kind of region. Networks that are node A, node B, node C, big places that concentrate a lot of agglomeration benefits, and somehow their connections count, but the territory in between them is a little bit neglected. And the second tier city idea is um, goes a bit in that direction. So one of the fundamental points I would insert here in the discussion, there are others, would be we need to maybe stop thinking too much about networks as an abstraction, but more about territories and about fields of urbanization rather than nodes, so that we can include everyone and every place in the discussion. And by doing that, we ensure that other places that have been neglected for years recognize the benefits, for example, of being integrated in such a region. We turn the Euro Delta idea from a brand circulating among policymakers into something to which people can identify with. Uh, we ensure willingness to cooperate and uh, resources coming together, et cetera, et cetera. This is, of course, a very long term uh, trajectory but we thought that it would be interesting to start there and using a little bit the mapping of different ports and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and infrastructures in those places to uh, launch a discussion a bit in this, in this direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Because So basically you're saying, okay, it's, it's interesting also maybe for this next generation, maybe Lucas would like to, to add uh, to, to that, but it's interesting to also focus on the in-between uh, places. I think it's interesting to have this relationship also with uh, the relationship of the different ports. Yeah? So uh, I know there's a lot of study going on in terms of the resilience of the, the, the hinterland networks that are there uh, in terms of the relationship and, and, the, and the logic of all of these different little nodes in this network in terms of how to facilitate um, uh, all of the different um, uh, uh, flows that are going through this, uh, this, this system. So I think also there you can see a sort of uh, interesting new rescaling going on. Uh, and so perhaps that's also an, a topic that, that can be raised. Um, Lucas, do you have something to add to, uh, to what Rodrigo just said? Well, first of all, also, thank you very much for having me and I'm uh, excited to to also use this a little bit as a as a starting point of the of the PhD that starts soon. And um, in the end, I think, um, yeah, to, to add to what uh, Rodrigo said is that we also like with the um, or also what, what Carola maybe said uh, at the beginning to to also show kind of the, the flows um, so that the the, the, the the sea is also urbanized in a way and that we have the the, the vessel tracks in the sea and the flows towards um, the maritime foreland and then of course all the different separate nodes of ports and port city infrastructure towards the hinterland and that we cannot plan for port and city as a closed entity anymore and in the end then we thought more or less that um, 
this or the port as an asset could be the, the, the opportunity for a more polycentric um, um, development of this region. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, uh, Frank, to, uh, to, to give you the floor now, I think it will be timely also. Um, I was also thinking about this uh, idea that, uh, that Kobo raised in his presentation, that, that actually if you see a difference between the, the economic mist and the planner in terms of scale size. So I, I'm curious how you react to what Rodrigo just said and how, how that um, uh, reflects on, on your uh, research that you've done uh, throughout the years in this, uh, in this region. Okay, thank you, uh, Paul. Um, yeah, very interesting presentations and discussions. Um, well, to introduce me myself, I'm, I'm, I'm an economist indeed, so I look a bit uh, uh, to the same discussions, but sometimes from a different angle. So I was very intrigued by the whole discussion about the mapping, and um, I think that's it's very valuable, and we have not enough of it yet. But on the other hand, I think we still should look at the networks eh? because I just heard maybe we should not look so much on it. Okay, we should look at place-based development, but we should definitely also recognize that place-based development is in influenced by the networks, networks of people, networks of trade, networks of knowledge. So, um, and that already brings immediately uh, different functions of different networks on different scales. So. And I think that was central in all the presentations. So what is on the scale? Um, um, actually, Paul already asked it in the Mentimeter, on what scale do you work? Well, uh, ideally, you would work on a multi-level scale because all these things are interacting. Um, things from outside impact on your local circumstances and what you do locally actually influences your neighbors. So this network issue, um, I think it's very important. Uh, for different functions, um, the, the term functions I didn't hear so much, but they, they are implicitly there because ports, of course, they have a function. And what uh, Kobe mentioned about uh, networks of people in the train, yeah, that's about moving people around. Um, but if you think carefully about multi-level scales, um, we had a very European perspective today. I, I did the same kind of research in China. And there uh, they, they would call our cities, uh, well, extremely small. But they do also have um, a polycentric development in the Pearl River Delta or in other areas. Um, so that makes you wonder what is, what is the ideal scale? Well, 1.5 to 2 million, but maybe that's different around the world as well. So um, that's an important issue, functions and scale. And other thing interesting might be, uh, what are the trade-offs? I, I heard several trade-offs uh, between economics and sustainability, economic and social uh, dimensions. Um, and I think it's, it's quite a challenge, because that was the question of Paul, what are challenges? The challenges are how to see those trade-offs and how to make a design in such a way that you, um, you can serve these this different domains. And I think uh, that is the more important, since um, it was already mentioned, we have this uh, time dimension is important, but uh, that also means that we should look at the future and that we have uh, quite large transitions to come uh, in energy, in circularity and other issues. So how can we apply what we uh, learn today? Because uh, I learned a lot actually. Uh, and I'm thinking, how can we apply it also to, to future development that is economically sustainable and also ecologically and socially sustainable? And the last thing I want to say, because well, I'm an economist and usually they are referred to as the causality police. So uh, there is a lot of issues about causality, of course, involved. Uh, does agglomeration cause uh, economic growth or are regions that are growing very fast in economics lead to more agglomeration? Yeah. So it's not to um, make a bad party entrance, uh, but it is important to identify these things. Uh, but I think um, that it is possible to do so by working together. But that was just my um, my personal uh, last view. But I think, especially the trade of the functions and the networks uh, and the skills, I think they are very important issues. They were raised today. But the, the the issue is how to link them. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of this causality, maybe also a little bit as an advice to this next generation. And and, and 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 this idea of Eric, like what is the strategic intervention in in the on the level of the Euro Delta on this sort of very densely connected, strangely connected, maybe also 
uh, area of different places, of different cultures, of different feelings. Um, at a certain moment, you can ask yourself, like, what what does it matter? Eh? How um, like does it does it make sense to to try to achieve um, uh, uh, some sort of clarity about the causality of things, or can we just take a certain approach of which we can say, well, um, it's um, that's a no regret kind of uh, approach that we could uh, could yeah. take. Do you, yeah, I agree do you have much with advice to the students or the, or the yeah. next generation yeah. in that respect? On, on the other hand, if you do introduce policy that is costly uh, and you want to favor certain regions over others or certain infrastructure over others, uh, you would like to know something about causality. Um, but it should not be too, too dominant. I agree with you. Um, but on the other hand, you, you can also not ignore it. Uh, so if in the Netherlands, if you do something, in, in large infrastructure, it will be tested by the CPB Bureau for, for these issues. Yeah. So you, you better think about it uh, clearly. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree with Paul. Um, on the one hand, you need vision and it, it should not restrict yourself. But on the other hand, uh, it should also not be neglected. Yeah, Christa, maybe you can maybe you can continue from there. Yeah, because I, I'm also curious how that works eh? when you, you're involved in all of these, uh, uh, these regional spatial strategies. At a certain moment, you, you must feel the need, like Frank says, for a certain causality, also in terms of uh, uh, getting uh, uh, politicians to uh, agree with you. But on the other hand, there's also this power of the idea and that, uh, that, yeah. that gains its but, own yeah, traction. My, my experience was that mapping can be really a powerful medium um, to come to a kind of change of perspective. And our important maps regarding the rural area were those maps who showed the demographic change and the support of the population by educational institutions. And when we presented this map, all the politicians, politicians were asking me, can we use these maps um, uh, to come to conclusions in our strategy for developing schools and so on? So, this was one experience, not only looking on the spatial strategy, but linking demographic economic data with spatial strategies. And then it comes um, to a kind of perspective change. And we agreed not to show anything which has no data. Yeah, because when you communicate all your analysis stuff, what you present, is based on data. It is not something which you just present as a kind of design strategy. This happens uh, really often. Then um, it's getting serious. And um, so showing the population development, where the young people live, where the older people live, where are the bad schools, where are the good schools, and at that moment, everybody was discussing about our lacks of education, of our mistakes in developing cities and, build it, and um, educational institutions. And then you see that these kind of mapping can have uh, a power in, um, in decision making. And then it, it's getting interesting. And regarding now the links between Germany and the Netherlands, when you don't show the border, when you only show um, the linkages in the landscape and you don't see where people are speaking Netherlands or German and where you don't see the different laws of planning, then you, you get somehow the feeling that it is necessary to, to change the per perspective on the whole region and that you have common problems and when you link, for example, um, yeah, the tracks for transportation, the landscape, then you gain in all these fields. And to show how you can gain, this makes mapping uh, powerful. And this is what, what me interests, not uh, to produce maps, but to strengthen discussions among politicians um, to 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 follow one pathway. Yeah, uh, I, um, 
intriguing thoughts uh, goes through my mind, but Carola, you would like to add to that? Yes, I was going to come back to some of the things that Frank also said before, because I think it is, may even be more complex than thinking of borders, territories, or networks, because some actors are stronger than others. A port authority like the one of Rotterdam or even Duisburg and the connections that exist there have their own power. And if a logistics company goes to Fenlo, the mayor of Fenlo might not have the same relationship or the same power than a city of Rotterdam has. So there are also, I think it's a, in, in a networked approach, but it's not necessary in that sense polycentric because there will be different centers of power and centers of, of relationship between institutions, stakeholders, people who are pitched against each other. So in that sense, I think it's, it needs to be even more complex which also means what Christa was just saying about mapping. Yes, there's a part to always go on the concrete statistics and the, the, the data that can be at least double checked. But on the other hand, when you look at visual representations of specific objects, uh, think about the debranding of the oil industry in the port of Rotterdam. So you have specific objects that are more seen, more visible, gas stations are much more visible than the refineries. So what is it that we actually see? And also to map those things that may not be quite as statistics based, but I think we also need these maps. They need again to be done in a very conscious way and not just as, not, not, not purely artistic, although that has its own value. But I, I'm, I would like to shift it a bit to that more culture discussion. And in some ways what I'm thinking of is also the case of Belgium, where you have both regions and communities. Uh, so you have the, 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 the Flemish region and the Flemish communauté, which oh, that shouldn't be, have been in French, the, the Wallon. Uh, but so that these can, you can have a cultural affiliation with one group while being physically in a different region. And I think that complexities of layers that shift is something that we really need to also take into account. Yes. Can I say something, Paul? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. I'm also thinking about um, um, Edward Glazer, the most uh, famous urban economist. He brings out the next, uh, his next book next week. It's about the survival of the city, and his previous book was The Triumph of the City. Um, he believes the city is still uh, going to thrive, even after Corona. But his, his strategy was always... Um, Look at the self-organization of people and the self-organization of business. Let them self-organize as long as um, a, you take out barriers. So the border can be a barrier or the, the, the labor market. So you, people have to be educated. But uh, some people commented on that saying, yeah, that will always favor the largest cities. So then people move to London and all the other cities in the United Kingdom are uh, what, they, what they now call uh, left behind. So. Um, on the one hand, there's this uh, um, strategy of self-organization, and he says that's the most powerful organization there is. There is no policy that can do anything better, except if you have a different objective. So if you want other regions also to develop, if you want a more equal distribution, yeah, then you have to introduce these things. And I think we are now on the crossroads of this thinking of uh, let the market organize versus, well, what do we want to direct with what kind of policies? Um, because we also see that uh, the places that are left behind are not very livable and are sustainably worse. So I think this is a very interesting discussion and I'm very looking forward to his new book because he, he promised to give some answers in there. <laughs> and and uh, well, it, of course, uh, that's, that's what his books are for, eh? delivering yeah. answers that everybody wants to go to the bookshop for to, to buy it. Um, it. It taps into a, to a point that was raised by... Uh, Amal in, in the chat, perhaps uh, he or she can come in just to see who's behind the question and maybe you can pose it. Great, there you are. You're still muted. No, we cannot hear you. Ah, now I hear you, I think. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Okay, sorry, I have some technical issues here. Now, I was just wondering about how all of these different um, topics can also be put forth into concepts of degrowth, you know, where you're no longer looking at visions just in ways in, to uh, continue this economic development. And um, let's say as well from like the political aspect to like push forth ideas of growth, but also of um, degrowth where you're redistributing um, based on informed opinion, based on democratic uh, ways of like uh, putting together these, these new visions for the future. And I think all of these inputs together from like, whether it comes from map ma making or whether it comes as well from um, uh, so social approaches to it as well, which maybe then aren't mapped, but just discussed, they can also then um, change an area, not in the way that we can say where it was traditionally changed, but like in a, in a new form for, for the futures of these, these spaces. But that was pretty much just um, a reaction to what was being said by Krista and um, Kaola and all. Yeah, great, great, uh, great idea. Also, I mean, um, uh, Franco already hinted towards that, but maybe Rodrigo, you would like to, uh, to react to that. Yes, it was on the back of my mind to react to something similar, uh, not directly for Mal's question, but maybe it relates to that. Um, and also when Frank mentioned the, the British cities and the, and the left behinds in comparison to London, and okay, in comparison to London, much of the UK is indeed uh, struggling and lagging behind. But I'm more concerned, and maybe the Aero Delta at that scale can also think about that, the inequalities and the development uh, differences within urban regions, right? W within the same urban region, there are huge discrepancies. And okay, you could add that, that through policy making, degrowth might be for the others, but ensured growth in the key places will, will remain. And if I can just very quickly share my screen, uh, am, am I allowed to do that? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I, I will try. Yes, I am allowed to do that. Um, where is it? Here it is. Because, well, I just put in the chat a book which is coming out next month about secondary cities. And me and Avert Myers have two chapters there, one by me and him and the other by him and me. <laughs> but basically, we discussed the type of um, how can we ensure that the different secondary cities in the city region have equal levels of success. Um, and uh, well, our findings go a, have to do with British cities and with Dutch cities. For example, this graph shows uh, 64 secondary cities in the eight UK city regions, including London and all the other core cities of the UK, um, and shows the cities that approach two things which in the economic geography are usually taken as positive economic uh, assets. And these are a demography which is closer to the core city in terms of diversity, composition, for example, of younger educated strata, et cetera. And, uh, and this one is functional performance for so more urban functions. And you see that there are very few cities approaching that. Uh, only a few, and these cities of higher functional performance and closer demography to the core city also show higher population growth, greater transport connectivity, and all and a series of other important indicators um, that have to do with uh, economic success. So they would be borrowing size, so to speak. Um, and then uh, for Dutch cities, this has been also tested by all the municipalities of the ranch that, and you see how within the region, they do, they are all over the place. Some performance expected, some borrow size, some are under the agglomeration shadow. So it's a huge mess of uh, a distribution of, of, of cities. And, uh, and again, linking to what I said before, how do we ensure that places which are struggling and do not see at all the benefits of uh, contributing to a regional project um, how do we ensure that they adhere to this idea? Uh, how do we treat this within region um, um, differentiations? And that's a little bit also uh, yeah, one of our interests so far. And I thought that it would be relevant for further discussions uh, at yeah. the point that we are now. Well, I think it's a, it's an interesting point raised, and um, and it's a good that we that we go towards this different direction. 
Um, I'm, I'm very sorry to have to cut short this discussion now. I always see Krista uh, sort of uh, needing to move away. I think we have all that feeling that it's, uh, it's uh, way too much oh, to be discussed now. Oh, but I have another lecture at two. Therefore, <laughs> I'm just a little bit nervous. Yes, well, of course, I know the feeling. Uh, and, uh, and so I think we all know. Uh, so I, I think we have to, um, to wrap it up for now. Um, I hope to see you back uh, tomorrow when we have the practitioner view um, in um, um, in the lunch forum, and then I hope also um, that you will all join in the in the in the Friday afternoon session uh, when we uh, when we get to the ideas presented by the next generation, which which for this is actually all input for that. So I think. Thank you very much for all your contributions. I think it's a great step, great step forward and, uh, and much uh, uh, food for thought for the coming days. So uh, I would like to end, end it there. Thank you all very much and I hope to see you uh, tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure for us. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.